Sean, for that introduction, and um, thanks to the uh, Department of Lab Medicine, and uh, thank all of you for uh, joining us today. So um, the landscape of HIV vaccines um, over the past 35 years has had many ups and downs, and I'll highlight some of those, highlight some of the progress um, that we're making today, um, some of the overall challenges, um, and um, you know, most um, of this is in the context of my work at the HIV Vaccine Trials Network, the HVTN. I also, as Sean mentioned, um, the medical director of the Seattle Malaria Clinical Trials Center, where we infect uh, altruistic Seattleites with malaria to evaluate drugs and vaccines, and also run a lab that investigates the role of the microbiome in training the immune system and influencing vaccine responses. So one cannot really talk about HIV without providing some context and background to this um, uh, enormous pandemic that's occurred and probably started over 100 years ago in um, several trans species transmission events from non-human primates to humans and the subsequent dramatic uh, distribution of what became human immunodeficiency virus around uh, Central African uh, Republic, the Democratic uh, Republic of Congo, and uh, via Kinshasa to the rest of Africa. And from this article, um, you do see the two groups, Group M and O, of HIV that spread dramatically within that region. And the article does highlight as well that iatrogenic or physician-caused medical interventions in Kinshasa and its surrounding area um, probably contributed to this dramatic distribution of HIV. And indeed, when um, I was living in Malawi with my, my family for three years, I was investigating the interaction between HIV and malaria. And of course, one of the most dramatic um, upticks of HIV among children who had malaria was transfusion-related HIV acquisition when they were um, transfused for severe malaria anemia. But we've seen that um, when HIV really emerged in, um, in the United States, it was indeed isolated among predominantly gay um, populations in San Francisco and in New York, in the coastal areas, a few sporadic cases in the middle of the country. But because of that demographic and because of the time, there was a tremendous amount of, of stigma that was related um, to HIV, and in fact, um, some tragic delays in attending to the um, urgent public health uh, crisis that was emerging in the 1980s. And indeed, many of the characters um, who were present at that time are still with us today, um, uh, such as uh, the former mayor, uh, Rudy Giuliani, um, and the delayed response um, to uh, the HIV epidemic, as it was observed at that time, was, um, the, was um, uh, the result uh, resulting from that was really a tremendous activism and advocacy effort that, um, that prompted the FDA to take a great deal of action. And I attended this um, uh, quilt at, on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. in 1987. It was a very emotional and, um, and heavy event. Um, the quilts covered um, almost the entire National Mall. Um, in 1996, it expanded um, even further, of course, and subsequent to that, they could no longer hold this event in Washington, D.C. because there simply were too many uh, quilts um, for those uh, recognizing um, those who passed away from HIV. Fortunately, um, we've come to recognize some of the complexity of the virus, investigating the virology, the immunology that surrounds HIV vaccine research. And on the left, you see an image generated by Betty Korber over um, uh, 20 years ago that was um, highlighting the tremendous diversity of HIV in the large um, uh, aquamarine outlined area you see um, the um, diversity of HIV as it was represented in the Congo in a single year, and up, up, upper left, the global influenza diversity um, in uh, that same period of time. 
and a more recent publication on the right highlighting the tremendous diversity of glycosylation and of sequence variation that exists within HIV compared to influenza or RSV uh, virus. This providing one of the most significant challenges to uh, developing an HIV vaccine. Now, fortunately, we have seen tremendous progress in HIV therapy. And um, in contrast to those years in the late 80s when I was working in New York City, in which all of the young men who, who looked like me were under um, hospice care, um, we saw in the 90s a tremendous advance with regard to HIV therapy. And I've highlighted in the uh, figure on the left some of the um, seminal uh, events that were very significant for advances in laboratory medicine with regard to HIV diagnosis, testing for HIV viral loads, and FDA-approved tests to identify resistant strains and profiles of viruses to better manage those individuals um, who were HIV infected. And on the right, we see the HIV medication chart for 2019 this year and the tremendous diversity and combination antiretrovirals, single pills that can be taken by individuals who are HIV infected, controlling their HIV virus, which of course, when I was in medical training, was just uh, a fantasy. Now, throughout the past 30 years, HIV has provided us a tremendous opportunity to work globally and to enter into communities who are heavily affected by HIV. And this exists in practically every country around the world. And indeed, HIV and AIDS research has claimed to um, provide the foundation for what many of us are now calling global health. But the stigma and the, and the challenges of working with these communities has, has not gone away. This is just um, from two years ago, ACT UP protesters in New York demonstrating against the Uganda's controversial anti-homosexuality bill. We work in Uganda, we work in Sub-Saharan Africa, and the sensitivity around working, um, especially among men who have sex with men, um, transgendered populations, and uh, commercial sex workers um, makes our work that much more challenging, especially in engaging with these communities, um, obtaining uh, adequate informed consent, um, and, and working on these uh, HIV vaccine efficacy trials in these communities. So where are we in 2019? Well, on the left, we see the figures highlighting the 90-90-90, the UN AIDS target for 2020, that's just next year. Um, identifying those who are HIV infected, 90% of those, um, putting those 90% um, on uh, adequate uh, antiretroviral therapy, and hopefully suppressing 90% of those um, such that their viral loads are uh, below detectable. But still, there are globally over a million new infections annually. That's 5,000 acquisitions a day. Um, over 180,000 uh, newborns infected, 37 million people li living with HIV, and that number just continues to grow as we've made tremendous advances with uh, therapeutics. And um, now only uh, 770 million deaths in 2018, which is down now below the millions that it was every year um, for the past uh, 30 years and surpassed, as you may know recently, by uh, TB being the most significant um, uh, infectious, single infectious agent causing mortality worldwide. So why an HIV vaccine? Why is an HIV vaccine necessary in the context of such successes with therapy? Um, as Tony Fauci and Hillary Marston uh, stated, ultimately we believe the only guarantee of a sustained end of the AIDS pandemic lies in a combination of non-vaccine prevention methods and the development of a safe and effective HIV vaccine. And the need for an HIV vaccine persists even um, with the very recent data that has come out this summer on uh, treatment as prevention. There were three um, publications in the New England Journal on July 18th highlighting both the progress and the limitations of our expectations in making progress against the pandemic with treatment as prevention. Now, U equals U is a correct equation. That's undetectable equals uninfected, uh, uninfectable. 
and that is those individuals who do have adequate uh, treatment, who are suppressing their viral loads, are not transmitting HIV to their partners, which is a tremendous advance. PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis, has um, worked very effectively, especially among MSM populations in pockets in the United States and in Europe, in some areas in South America and in Southern Africa, but significant challenges remain with regard to the further deployment of PrEP worldwide. And just today, the Office of AIDS Research released a report stating to bring about a lasting end to the global uh, pandemic, we must continue research efforts to find a safe and effective vaccine, echoing what Tony Fauci said five years ago. So the impact of an HIV vaccine is very significant, even if partially effective. And we've seen recent um, advances with a partially effective malaria vaccine. However, malaria is curable. HIV, with the exception of the Berlin patient, has not um, been cured. And so when we look at the, the projections and the models of um, using a partially effective vaccine in combination with these prevention modalities that already exist, we see a dramatic reduction in the number of um, new infections that occurred worldwide, the number of deaths that occur, of course, the incidents drop, dropping precipitously with an effectively deployed vaccine. And we've also recently uh, published on how cost effective an HIV vaccine is um, compared to other standards of care, PrEP or PrEP combinations. And the cost of HIV therapy and the different prevention interventions that are used around the world is in the tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars annually very significant, significant dollars. So how do we go about developing a vaccine? On the left is a, a cartoon illustrating the many different strategies that one can use to uh, develop a vaccine. We're not uh, pursuing whole inactivated HIV uh, virus vaccines. There have been some um, efforts directed toward that, but fundamentally, uh, you know, the community feels that is simply too risky for um, the, uh, the virus and the, and the sequelae of HIV infection. And there are several different endpoints or potential outcomes of an HIV vaccine. Of course, uh, we can prevent HIV acquisition. And in the, uh, this is a cartoon about potential endpoints for an HIV vaccine efficacy trial. If there is prevention of acquisition, quote, sterilizing immunity induced, then you would see no infections in the vaccine arm. If the vaccine arm can uh, prevent systemic infection or potentially abort that infection, we would see a transient infection, but eventually elimination of that virus from the body. Or preventing HIV disease, and that is, as some of the elite controllers have demonstrated, the immune system can suppress HIV if uh, sufficiently directed against critical epitopes in the virus. So to provide the context of where we are today, I think it's very important to describe um, a couple events that have led us to this point in time, especially these two tectonic events that have occurred in the past decade, the Step and Pombili trials, which I'll describe to you briefly, demonstrated no efficacy, and then a, there was an actual increase in acquisition in, in the um, active arm versus placebo. And fortunately, the RV144 tie trial, as it's called, demonstrating 31% efficacy in reducing acquisition in the vaccine arm. And we at the HVTN have been involved in both of these uh, vaccine trials. The first one um, um, was run by the HVTN and sponsored initially by Merck and transferred to uh, DADES at NIH. The second one by the military HIV research program, and we worked, uh, have worked very closely with them in much of this follow-up work. So on the left is a, is a table that highlights the risk of HIV acquisition over time by AD5 and circumcision status in the STEP clinical trial. Now this clinical trial used the adenovirus type 5 vector that had gag, pol, and nef genes um, stitched into that vector. There were no envelope um, proteins or genes <coughs> in the vector. 
And you see that the hazard ratio is increased um, in this um, uh, subpopulation who were uncircumcised and AD5 seropositive. That means they had pre-existing immunity to the AD5 vector. That immunity, in mu especially in mucosal, mucosal surfaces such as the um, foreskin, likely uh, provided an increased acquisition of HIV into those CD4 T cells. And we see on the right the, um, uh, the, the fact that fortunately the HIV acquisition decreased over time. The vaccine regimen was completed at six months. It decreased over time by 12, 18 months, and those individuals were no longer at persistent risk. Now, we do um, obviously have to take this very seriously. And, Engaging the community and communicating with the community and the study participants forced us into this remarkable um, equipoise in which um, we had to explain we did not know that this was going to be an outcome of this vaccine clinical trial. And the experience really forced us into a much more community engaged um, exercise than we would have anticipated. Now that said, it also generated an enormous amount of basic science, biological research, trying to understand why such an event could occur. In large part, there were um, you know, vaccine studies that were stopped. There was no progress um, moving forward into any further vaccine efficacy trials. And we really had to reevaluate the strategies that we were undertaking to induce immune responses that we thought would be protective against HIV. And indeed, this impacted the field, uh, fields much beyond HIV research and uh, even impacted the Ebola um, vaccine uh, development plan. And, um, and that was highlighted in this article in Forbes magazine because um, there was a tremendous momentum to try to deploy Ebola vaccines during the epidemic of uh, 2014 uh, and 15. And indeed, Tony Fauci highlighted uh, the STEP study as an example as to why a placebo-controlled randomized clinical trial is so important. Fortunately, about a year afterwards, the TIE trial results were published in the New England Journal, and we see here a significant difference um, between vaccine and placebo, with the probability of HIV infection being lower in the vaccine. And this um, uh, Estimated vaccine efficacy over time is illustrated in the figure on the right, and you see that vaccine efficacy appearing to peak over 50%, potentially 60%, and also waning over the course of uh, 12 to 18 months. The overall vaccine efficacy was reported as 31%, but again, it's during this critical period in the first uh, 12 months that we saw a relatively high vaccine efficacy of up, upwards of 60%. And this vaccine was a unique combination of a pox, uh, ALVAC, canary pox vector, with uh, a protein boost, the AIDSVAX uh, GP120 protein boost. So there was a tremendous effort in trying to interrogate what may be the correlates of protection for this vaccine. And when we talk about an immune correlate, this is a central goal of vaccine research. It's one of the major grand challenges that the Gates Foundation and the NIH have identified. And it's something that um, is incredibly useful for shortening trials, reducing costs, um, guiding the iterative development of vaccines. When you have that biomarker that's a correlate of protection, you can take it from 60% and iteratively investigate early phase clinical trials in just a handful of people to optimize that correlate of protection such that you can project a vaccine efficacy beyond 90%. Now, we don't have that confirmed for an HIV vaccine, but there are many examples of vaccines that have identified a mechanistic correlate of protection or a, a non-mechanistic correlate of protection, but still is reliable for these types of correlations. And I illustrate some of these examples here just to to make it clear that sometimes both mechanistic and non-mechanistic correlates of protection are known, and sometimes neither are known or only one of them is, is known, yet nonetheless, these are incredibly useful to further the vaccine development of this particular candidate. So for the RV144 trial, 
An intensive investigation of these correlates of protection were undertaken. It took over two years and tremendous effort of about 30 labs around the world um, validating these endpoints, um, you know, reproducible, um, if not validated, then qualified assays. And one of the significant correlates that fell out of that is the V1, V2, GP70 scaffold. And this is a part of the GP120, um, part of the trimer that is the envelope protein on the surface of HIV. And indeed, those individuals with a high V1, V2 um, uh, 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 binding antibody assay demonstrated uh, a vaccine efficacy of over uh, 70%. So when we look at how then to carry this further, we also looked at um, subsequent samples from that study and that initial New England Journal uh, article publication on the correlate of protection was followed up by about 30 additional publications investigating this V1, V2 correlate. And much of that work was done um, by sieve analysis. And that is uh, illustrated in this cartoon that highlights that simply with a natural barrier that each of us have for um, preventing HIV acquisition, and it may be only one in 100 exposures that, that truly results in HIV-established infection, we have these natural mucosal barriers um, and uh, immune barriers. And we see a certain distribution of infecting strains among a population um, in these natural cohorts. Ideally, when we see a vaccine-inducing uh, effect, we see pressure against the virus and only a limited number of strains then infecting those individuals who do uh, become infected who have received the vaccine. And it's in those individuals who have received the vaccine yet who have um, acquired HIV, that we're looking for critical comparisons to those individuals who received the vaccine and did not acquire HIV. So a central question post RV144, the TIE trial is, can we extend these findings? Can we increase the vaccine efficacy and increase the durability of that efficacy? Can we extend these findings to other populations? The TIE trial was conducted as a community-based clinical trial among 16,000 TIEs at primary care clinics who had all sorts of different risks for HIV, most of them not at significant risk for HIV acquisition. So when we think about transferring this to a high-risk population such as in South Africa, who generally have a higher viral load, a higher viral load within individuals, but also as, as estimated um, in the community, the, these are significant challenges. So these were some of the questions that we were posing after, these, uh, after the initial RV144 results. And what I'm gonna do now is walk through a number of the novel um, efficacy strategies that we currently have underway within the HVTN First highlighting HVTN702, which is the follow-on study to the RV144. And this um, study could not have happened without a very large uh, collection of partners, the, the P5 partnerships, Pox Protein Public-Private Partnership. We've said that a few times quickly. Um, and this is dedicated to building on the TIE trial results. Um, it, you know, having such a large collection of partners can be good, but it also can be quite challenging in herding these um, fairly large behemoth partners into the direction of uh, an efficient clinical development plan for an HIV vaccine. But the real strategy was foundational to building on these RV144 results. We had a new construct of ALVAC made that was focused on the clade C virus, a new construct of bivalent proteins manufactured that were also of subtype C. These were GP120 proteins, and then added a booster at 12 month, months to, to hopefully improve the durability of these immune responses. And these are some of the clinical trials, 097100, and ultimately 702, that we've progressed through to evaluate uh, uh, the potential efficacy of the pox protein combination. 
We did establish very firm uh, go no go criteria to move into the large uh, clinical trial called HVTN 702 or HUAMBO. And that clinical trial has enrolled, it completed enrollment in June of this year, 5,400 men and women in South Africa with a one to one uh, randomization of vaccine to placebo. Initially, the vaccine regimen included uh, the prime of ALVAC at months zero and one and a booster of ALVAC plus protein at months three, six, and 12. And this is a cartoon that illustrates uh, what we're really trying to target, the area under the curve of what we're expecting to be the protective efficacy of this vaccine. And now, um, as, you, as you see here in the top, we have a vaccine efficacy um, at you know, six to 12 months in RV144 estimated to be about 60%. The observed V1, V2 correlate of protection was 64% at six and a half months from that clinical trial. We observed 63% at um, uh, six and a half months in HVTN702. That increased to 72% at uh, 12 and a half months and we needed to achieve an observed V to uh, observe a vaccine efficacy greater than 50% needed V1, V2 responders of 69% at uh, 24 months. Unfortunately, we saw the vaccine correlate of protection, putative correlate of protection, these V1, V2 markers, decrease considerably and precipitously. Many of the binding, op binding uh, uh, antibodies persist for months, if not years, but some of them decreased very rapidly, and that included the V1, V2 responses. So we looked at how best to optimize this and improve to ensure that we had an opportunity to do the correlates of protection analysis from this clinical trial and added the booster at month 18 to uh, provide that additional vaccine boost to the V1, V2 biomarker, which will hopefully provide sufficient data for the correlates analysis that we're anticipating. As I mentioned, we completed enrollment in June of this year. On the right is our number of visits per day by month. At uh, the average number of visits a day that some of these sites have, have um, taken on. You know, some of these clinical trial sites have enrolled hundreds of individuals within the studies. And as you can see there, each day may see up to 200 people. We're now, of course, past this hump and are um, uh, looking forward to upcoming interim analyses, um, some of which are based on futility. We've made it through those interim analyses that would have detected potential harm. So we know the vaccine is not increasing acquisition, and hopefully then we'll see some vaccine efficacy that we can interrogate for, further for uh, the confirmation of a correlative protection. The second um, strategy that we have underway is a neutralizing antibody approach. <clears throat> and this is based on a passive immunoprophylaxis strategy. It's why the title of my talk was focused on immunization against HIV, not simply vaccination, because passive immunoprophylaxis has been used for many years. There's a long history of using antibodies pre to prevent infection or disease. And many of these interventions are, uh, have been developed into products for a number of different indications. And most uh, effective vaccines induced antibodies that neutralize the pathogen. Now, fortunately, um, over the past decade, we've seen a tremendous explosion in the isolation of broadly neutralizing antibodies against HIV. Um, despite the work that was done in the 80s and 90s, there were a uh, tremendous uh, recognition of, of swarms of antibodies that were, that were binding to HIV, but very few of them, if any, were neutralizing. <clears throat> but now we have uh, many of these um, neutralizing anti antibodies. They're broadly neutralizing, and they have been developed into monoclonal products. So antibodies can teach us an enormous amount about um, vaccine development, and we're focused on these passive immunoprophylaxis strategies to not only potentially use these monoclonal antibodies as a product to prevent HIV acquisition, if we can improve the, the half-life of these antibodies, if we could um, include them in um, 
uh, in, in some kind of depot uh, that goes into the arm and extends the, um, the distribution of those antibodies over the course of, of months, if not years. But we're also very interested in how then we can apply the knowledge gained from passive immunoprophylaxis to active vaccination strategies. What levels of these antibodies would be required to uh, protect HIV acquisition? And is it possible to actively induce these broadly neutralizing antibodies? So the first monoclonal antibody, broadly neutralizing that went into humans uh, is called VRCO1. This is a CD4 binding site antibody. It was developed by the Vaccine Research Center. It uh, demonstrated a very effective prevention of um, acquisition in the non-human primate model for both rectal and vaginal challenge. And we now have um, uh, a tremendous opportunity to learn more from a proof of concept in, uh, in humans. And I've, as I've mentioned, what level of antibody, what level of neutralizing antibody is needed to prevent infection? Um, could we potentially convert that monoclonal antibody level to serum levels of neutralization that are needed to protect that we could measure um, from active vaccination? Just a couple of, of the potential uh, tools that we could use from these um, antibody-mediated prevention studies, or AMPs. The first tri these are the first trials to assess if antibodies can be used to prevent HIV infection. Um, the two AMP trials that are currently underway essentially are using the same product, VRCO1. They're given every two months through an IV infusion in, at two different doses, again, to try to focus in on what is the titer of antibody that is required to prevent HIV acquisition. As you can see, we've enrolled now, um, it's over 4,600 uh, individuals around the world. Um, this effort has required an enormous uh, troop of individuals around the world. We've given over 40,000 uh, infusions of VRCO1. There are kilograms of uh, monoclonal antibody manufactured by the VRC that were required for, um, for these clinical trials. And we're still underway. I mean, we're, we're very intent on trying to, of course, address the primary objectives, the safety and tolerability of VRCO1. Given um, the tremendous growth in monoclonal antibodies as products over the past two decades, um, there's a tremendous amount of data on how tolerated these um, products are. Um, some of them are not tolerated very well. We've seen um, in these 40, over 40,000 infusions, very few infusion reactions. And so the monoclonal antibody appears to be very safe. And ultimately, we hope to determine the concentration of the antibody that may prevent acquisition and provide some insights into the mechanism, the mechanistic correlates of protection. Is it dependent on FC binding to the antibody by um, uh, other immune cells? So th this study was fully enrolled. We announced that almost a year ago. And as you can see on the right, the number of visits um, at each of, at all of our sites is decreasing. Um, uh, it's almost completed in the US. Um, and we have now follow-up visits in uh, South America and South Africa. Lastly, I'd like to highlight some of the work that we're doing in partnership with Janssen and they are a recent participant in HIV vaccine development. And um, we're there very thankful for that because they have focused on a new platform and technology. It isn't, it isn't directed at inducing broadly neutralizing antibodies, so it is similar in that respect to the P5 program in that it is focused on the induction of non-neutralizing antibodies that yet may prevent HIV acquisition. And um, we, similarly to uh, the P5 program, identified go-no-go no go criteria in moving forward. These criteria were, um, have recently been published and are based on the non-human primate challenge studies that demonstrated significant protection when um, administered this AD26 uh, vectored uh, vaccine in combination with um, HIV envelope proteins. And so the first study we started in Bokoto, um, again in Southern Africa, 
um, entirely in women, 2,600 women randomized one-to-one -one and followed, uh, will be followed for at least two years up to uh, three or, or more years if uh, significant vaccine efficacy is found so that we can be sure to um, assess the durability of the vaccine effect. This strategy is an interesting one. I mentioned the ADD26 vectors. It includes GAG and PAL, the two um, non-envelope genes of HIV, but also HIV envelope, not only that which is a clay B-like envelope, but a mosaic antigen. And then uh, the boost uh, of the vaccine regimen is the AD26 in combination with the GP140 clade C uh, trimer protein. And this is the first time that a trimer envelope protein has gone into an HIV vaccine efficacy trial. So we're very excited about that. And then we have an upcoming clinical trial that I'll also describe for you that has added on this additional mosaic envelope protein. And these mosaic... Um, constructs are, um, uh, again, back to Betty Korber, who provided us tremendous insights into the diversity of HIV 20, 30 years ago. She's been influential in helping us design vaccine inserts and envelope proteins that reflect the tremendous diversity of HIV around the world. And that diversity is, uh, of course, illustrated here in South Africa, where HIV incidence and prevalence is highest in um, Anywhere in the world is predominantly clade C. And the ADD6, ADD26 ad vector has these mosaic gene inserts. Um, and then the trivalent GP140 protein um, and the mosaic uh, uh, protein are all reflective of this diversity. So we have now HVTN706, which is the Mosaico study, starting um, in the Americas and Europe um, next month or rather this month, now we're in October. Um, we're slated to start it by the end of this month. And this will target 3,800 participants, predominantly men who have sex with men and some transgendered populations, randomized one to one, um, 1,900 in each arm. So conducting these clinical trials, especially in the age of, um, of PrEP and this HIV prevention toolbox, is not an easy endeavor. And so we anticipated in HVTN 706, which we're just starting, some significant challenges in trying to find individuals who are at risk for HIV acquisition. And in the Americas, and in many parts of the world, and in Europe, where PrEP uptake is very high, we know that it works effectively. If you're adherent to PrEP, if you're taking daily PrEP, you're not at increased risk for HIV acquisition. Your, uh, the, the effectiveness of PrEP is incredible if you're adherent. So we convened this meeting a year ago to try to get community input on how do we move forward, identifying trial design and different approaches that um, can provide, provide us direction. And, um, you know, there was uh, a tremendous discussion with community, with advocates, with the scientists, with the funders about how best to move forward. And fundamentally, it came down to this, what they described as a mosaic of options that we needed to provide people in these communities to determine whether or not they were truly at risk for HIV. And a fundamental thing there is the importance of choice. Conducting trials of new products in individuals not successfully using oral PrEP. But that can be quite challenging, especially in resource-constrained areas or in vulnerable populations who may not have ready access to PrEP. So you need to provide that PrEP before they enter the study. And that's something that we're, we've undertaken uh, intensively over the past year in working with communities and trying to understand how best to provide PrEP in these communities so that individuals can assess whether or not it's, not it's for them. Much of the PrEP uh, work that's been done demonstrates that up to 50% of individuals who go on PrEP are no longer on PrEP after three months. Now, are their sexual risk behavior um, uh, indices changing after those three months? Most times not. They still remain at risk for HIV. So that's one mechanism which we may be able to funnel individuals into our clinical trials 
is ensuring that PrEP is available in the community. If they stay on PrEP, fantastic. They're not at risk. They cannot be in a vaccine efficacy trial. If they drop off PrEP for whatever reason, we would consider them for the efficacy trial. It raises a tremendous amount of ethical, moral, educational uh, issues in working in these communities. And we've undertaken that over the past year. The HVTN community engagement model relies on foundational community education and recruitment efforts, ensuring that consent is very clear. We develop videos for these people. And of course, reconsenting and ensuring that we can retain these individuals over time. So with that, I've highlighted these four main strategies that we're undertaking right now. This will be a pivotal event this, later this month. It will be the fifth consecutive running vaccine efficacy trial for HIV. In the course of the, of the pandemic, there have only been five other efficacy trials, and we now have five of them running concurrently. The operational logistics uh, required to conduct this work hi is highlighted here by the number of clinical trial sites that we work at in the Americas and Africa. We're also going to be working in 706 in Italy, Spain, and Poland. And the number of enrollees per year illustrated in the middle highlights the ebb and flow of how one uh, has to manage these large clinical trials. This is the site activity that we've projected out over the coming years. It highlights, of course, the peaks that occurred in 2017 and 2018. But what happens in the future is largely dependent on what we observe in these five efficacy trials, some of which will be providing us results in the next 12 months. And it's in a landscape of complex biomedical prevention that includes other modalities, such as vaginal ring, I mentioned the oral prep, long-acting injectables will, will be um, providing results in January of 21, and of course, the antibodies and preventive HIV vaccines, which I've highlighted. While all of this large efficacy trial work is ongoing, we have a very robust, broadly neutralizing antibody active vaccination program very early in uh, phase one clinical trials. We have a number of different approaches to that focused on stable trimers in vaccine designs, a lineage-based vaccine strategies targeting the germline um, to induce broadly neutralizing antibodies, and some of these epitope vaccine designs using um, very unique uh, constructs uh, and scaffolded vaccines. We're looking at um, experimental medicine strategies to conduct these clinical trials as rapidly and iteratively as possible. And this is simply a highlight of some of these early phase one products that we anticipate to put in the clinic in the next 12 to 18 months. All of this in the context of interrogating the immune responses, and this is uh, highlighting, this figure highlights the HVTN Lab Center's um, development of assays from 2012 to 2019 across these four broad categories of assays, um, you know, genetic, mucosal, humoral, and cellular responses, and, and Julie McElrath and the, and the lab team here have really advanced the field tremendously as far as how to interrogate the immune system in both its response to vaccines, but also, of, of course, in its response to a natural infection. And for lab medicine, one of the significant challenges for us happens to be the induction of these immune responses. And this is an uh, illustration of the fifth generation of um, HIV diagnostic assays that have been developed over the past uh, 30, 35 years. And we're expecting and hoping that we'll be, there will be a significant sixth or seventh generation in the coming years, in large part because vaccine-induced seropositivity and reactivity is a very significant ethical and regulatory consideration that we must take. And this is um, the induction of antibodies against HIV that are also reactive in an HIV diagnostic test. Individuals are not infected, but they are reacting positive to some of the tests. So that's what we call VISP. Implications of VISP test results can range across the spectrum of um, potential harm and discrimination to uh, challenges with pregnancy, being placed on antiretrovirals when you're not infected, and even potential for unblinding 
um, unnecessarily or, or uh, uh, inappropriately in the conduct of our RCT clinical trial. These tests are very common. Uh, they're not common with some vaccines. And some may attribute that to them not being very effective at all. Some of them induce very uh, uh, high levels of these antibodies that are durable in years, if not decades. So it's going to be a significant challenge for us as the field evolves. And of course, we've developed an enormous amount of resources for participants and healthcare providers to ensure that they're informed with this. So I go back to the potential impact of an HIV vaccine. These are two publications, one from 2007 on the left and one recently just uh, two years ago in PNAS, highlighting the tremendous impact a partially effective HIV vaccine will have. And I'd like to close highlighting much of the HVTN um, resources that exist for clinical, laboratory, um, bio, biosocial, ethical uh, investigations. And um, we have a treasure trove of data. Um, all of these different product types have been tested in over 75 clinical trials in the HVTN. We cannot do this work without tremendous collaborations with scientists, social behavioral scientists to, you know, uh, humoral and, and geneticists and virologists. And uh, there are unique opportunities, whether it be within the local CIFAR, uh, Center for AIDS Research, um, some of the um, many uh, announcements that come out of NIAID and NIH and other funders, especially around uh, early stage investigators. And that is something that we're also trying to nurture and encourage within the HVTN. We recently, in the past year, um, provided our specimen inventory at uh, specimensrepository.org and have uh, over 2 million specimens um, and, of course, a tremendous amount of data um, that is, exists there. And with that, I would like to thank mostly our study participants, the tremendous teams um, that we work with around the world, and thank you very much. Open it up for questions. Yes. Um, thank you for that very excellent and fascinating talk. Um, given how much uptake that there is of the PrEP um, currently, how would you or how would you respond to the six cases of um, PrEP failure in people who have um, who are known to be highly adherent? Do you think that are there concerns that eventually, given the high uptake of PrEP, that um, HIV strains may eventually be selected for PrEP um, resistance in the future? Thank you for the question. And repeating it for those online, the, the question is, what are our thoughts about um, the uptake of PrEP, uh, particularly those um, six cases recently reported um, that were breakthrough infections among individuals who were highly adherent to PrEP? And um, did I reflect your question? Yes. So, you know, there, there's a, you know, a very well-known um, history of, of antiretroviral resistance um, with HIV, and it's, it's um, not that surprising that it will occur even among those who are highly adherent to PrEP. Um, PrEP. The PrEP landscape is likely to try to stay ahead of that curve and respond to it by developing novel drugs um, at the International AIDS uh, meeting this past summer. Um, there were compounds presented um, from early phase studies that have uh, remarkable activity against the virus with uh, very long half-lives. How they're applied, how safe they are, what sort of adverse uh, events occur in these clinical trials have yet to be determined. But similar to drug resistance, we're also concerned about vaccine resistance, vaccine strain um, resistance. And that's been illustrated in um, malaria vaccines, of course, which I'm very close to. It's been illustrated in dengue vaccines. Um, so it is a, a natural, in my opinion, biological, con biological conundrum um, that we're going to have to stay ahead of. 
um, as we evolve our prevention modalities, whether that be enteroviral based or immunologic based. Yes. Again, thank you for a very exciting talk. Um, the emphasis that you presented is on antibody mediated protection. Uh, is there a role, do you think, still for looking at T cell responses, or is this all going to be ADCC and cells an uh, helping antibodies? What, what's your thought about that? Oh, that's a great question. Well, you know, um, I love CD4 cells um, um, because you wouldn't have good antibodies without them. And so we're. Um, Apologies to those T cell biologists out there. I, I didn't highlight that uh, sufficiently today. Antibodies are dependent on T cells, and um, T cell responses are going to be critical. Indeed, from RV144, there was a polyfunctional T cell response. It also was uh, significant correlative protection, and of course, we're looking at that in, in the P5 program and anticipate that there will be um, T cell correlates as well. I think the, the, the hope or the, the, you know, the Merck vaccine, the MRK ad 5 vaccine was directed at, at eliciting T cells. And, um, and I think it, it is um, a very significant challenge to rely solely on T cells. I do think we need both. John? I have a question. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, viral loads tend to be higher. So that's one thing. Is, is that just access to care question? And then given all the differences in clades, is it unreasonable to say that you actually need a geographically specific vaccine? Because, you know, like in microbiology, we tailor antibiotics. We say microbiology is local like politics, right? And we would love one vaccine. But is that... Is it really feasible to have one vaccine, or do we more pragmatically have to rely on strain-specific vaccines? I think that um, the mosaic constructs that we're currently testing will help us answer that. Um, the, the P5 program, HVTN702, does not have these mosaic. It is clade-specific. Um, and one can look at, in these sieve analyses, the genetic distance between the strain in the vaccine and the strain that is circulating or that is um, in the infected individual. So I think we'll, we'll, we'll gain a tremendous amount of knowledge as the results of these efficacy trials emerge over the next two to five years that will help answer that question. Ideally, no, we can rely on these mosaics. Um, we may have to reconstruct those mosaics as the as the pandemic evolves in the coming decades, but that's that's the strategy. Noah, sort of a follow up or correlate to Sean's question: What what is the regulatory framework for developing these uh, vaccine products, and is that framework up to the task of uh, supporting the development of geographically you know geographically targeted vaccines or vaccines that have to change over time to accommodate? changes in the population structure of the virus. Right. So is the regulatory framework framework sufficiently prepared for the potential of strain-specific HIV vaccines? Well, we see flu um, vaccines come out every, every year. And um, I don't think we'll need, we need them every year. I mean, uh, that would be quite a challenge, especially given the bio biological complexity of these vaccines. And as you've seen, the regimens are also fairly complex. Now, the intent <coughs> and why I emphasize so much these correlates of protection is because, you know, if we can simplify the regimen, um, you know, that, that makes the, the implementation of these that much more feasible. Um, and we've seen significant challenges to the implementation of HPV vaccine and, and other highly effective vaccines that are not deployed sufficiently in, in target populations. So I, I do think the regulatory framework um, and, and the regulatory bodies will be prepared for it, but it will require uh, a tremendous amount of work and also sufficient surveillance of, uh, of course, the circulating strains that do exist. And there's a fair amount of that going on now but um, in the broadly neutralizing antibody arena, whether it be passive 
immunoprophylaxis or active vaccination to induce those BNABs, that will also be a, a critical component to try to stay ahead of waning vaccine efficacy as a result of the evolution of the virus around the vaccine. Yes. Um, so I was wondering about whether you think that the correlates of protection might actually be different in different populations. So if, if different risk factors might um, cause, you know, certain factors to be more or less important. No, that's a, that's a great question. I think it's very, um, and that question is the, um, whether or not it's feasible or, or likely that there would be different correlates of protection among those uh, different risk populations. So I couldn't, you know, envision the, the biological protection that occurs in the rectal mucosa um, may be somewhat different than in, in the cervical mucosa. And, um, and the type of effector cells in those different anatomic compartments may be unique. Um, that is something that we will also be investigating. We, we have a tremendous um, mucosal immunology program within the network that is um, collecting biopsies and biopsies from just about everywhere. And so I think um, we'll be able to interrogate that. But of course, it, it can only be done in the context of these vaccine efficacy trials where we have a signal. Um, so the, stay tuned, because these results will be coming sooner than uh, often we think. Do you see a therapeutic misconception among some of your high-risk populations where they figure I'm in a vaccine trial and they, they up their risky behaviors? Um, and how do you correct for that? How do you deal yeah. with that? So uh, the question is, do we see therapeutic misconception, that is, um, a risk modification because people are participating in these, in these clinical trials? And we do have, as I mentioned, a, a pretty significant social behavioral um, research program. Um, we're excited to collaborate with people who have unique ideas and want to, want to join that effort. We have observed both, and, and in large part, this goes back to the STEP study in which we did see e increased acquisition of HIV among the vaccine recipients. And so we did, we, there was an intensive interrogation of all of the social behavioral data that we had and biomarker data of potential exposures in those populations. We saw that when <coughs> individuals came into the study, their risk in both vaccine and placebo came down in both arms. It remained, it came down in, in the first six months and then started to creep up again. And I think that, you know, that's a, a, a um, attribute to the, the clinic staff and the prevention counseling that's provided in the context of enrolling into the clinical trial itself. Um, and, and I think we're very clear that we don't know if this is going to decrease not work or increase your risk of HIV acquisition. And of course, we don't know if you're getting vaccine or placebo. That's one of the concerns about the vaccine-induced seroreactive positive issue. Um, if people are unblinding themselves and they, th they then know they receive the vaccine, will they disinhibit their behavior? And we monitor that very closely. One more question? Yeah, yeah I was... Uh impressed by the kilogram kilogram quantities of monoclonal antibody. Could you tell us a little bit about that antibody? Because at first pass, with all the glycosylation variations that you pointed out at the beginning of your talk, it's not straightforward to think about a monoclonal antibody being efficacious, but it's an awesome tool if you have a great one. It is an awesome tool if you have a great one. And, and the VRCO1 uh, monoclonal that was now identified over a year ago, I have a, I have a slide um, it illustrates the immense progress that was made just in this decade, identifying that from um, an elite controller from Africa, isolating that monoclonal, um, producing it in milligram quantities to evaluate it in, in non-human primates, um, expanding its production into 1,000-liter um, bioreactors, and cranking that out over the past uh, four years um, 
And at one point, had we had to slow down enrollment into the clinical trial because there was not sufficient volume of material. Um, since that time, and we could spend an hour talking about BNAPs, broadly neutralizing antibodies, there are other antibodies out there that are so much more highly neutralizing than VRCO1. Mm -hmm. And modifications to these antibodies, to the FC region in particular, that extends the half-life two, three, four times more than VRCO1. So the technologies that we have now, or in 18 months or 12 months from now, when we have the results of these AMP trials, and specifically, of course, combinate, when you put two or three of these BNABs together, you're really looking at, at preventing HIV acquisition, period. At least that's what we'd hypothesize, and that's what we've observed in vitro and in the non-human primates. So it'll be a very exciting time in the, in the next five years as we adjust to the results and plan for the future.